get the ushers to come. We're going to take out the morning offering. Um, and really, there you go this morning that uh, it's good soil and it's good investment because everything that's invested in is we really are pouring back out to reach our community for the gospel of Jesus Christ and to make sure that this body right here is equipped to do the work of service and the things that you, God has created you for. So as you uh, pray about giving this morning, as the scripture says, uh, whatever you've decided in your heart to give as the Holy Spirit speaks to you, just know that you're sowing into a good investment. Amen. Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to gather together and worship today. Thank you for your presence. Lord, thank you for the word that we're about to receive today. Uh, Father, that we would have that determination in our heart that we are being equipped for good works that you prepared ahead of time for us to do. That there's purpose and that there's destiny for every person sitting in this place today. So, Father, bless this offering and multiply it for your kingdom work in Jesus' name. Amen. If you guys would welcome uh, Pastor Jamie as he comes to share with you this morning. Oh, wow, a couple people love me here. Oh, I love you guys too. Some of you guys. <laughs> no, I love y'all. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing? You guys doing good? All right. Well, uh, super excited to be here with you this morning. Uh, I am battling a little cold today, so if I start coughing, just please forgive me. Um, I do haven't preached since we had our baby girl, so I want to like, wait, wait, let's, we have the PowerPoint up here. I brought a little picture for you of baby Arrow. Um, she is so sweet, um, and for those of you guys that have like been pressuring us to keep having more babies, uh, in the words of Jesus, it is finished. <laughs> it is finished. All right? My quiver is full. It's overflowing. If you want some, you can have some. <laughs> um, no, but, you know, it's funny. I, I'm raising four girls, okay? I'm looking for a counselor. Um, and I don't have much money. But um, these are my girls. I am so, so blessed to have four beautiful girls. I'm scared to death, but I have four girls. And... Uh, it's, it's funny, I picked up my six-year-old, I knew I was in trouble, picked my six-year-old Kaya up, and she is in first grade, I repeat, first grade. Pick her up from school, and she gets in my car, and she says, Dad, I said, yeah, Kaya, what's up? She goes, Dad, I love boys. And then she came on to say, they're so cute. I said, Kaya, they're evil. Run from them. And uh, you're not going to believe me. My wife always has come back. Did this really happen? Because, you know, I'm a storyteller. And, uh, but she came back to the house, and we were eating dinner. And she looks at me, and she says, Dad. I said, yeah. I know what I want for my birthday. And I'm like, really, Kaya, what is it? She goes, Dad, I want a boyfriend. <laughs> so I'm going to homeschool. I bought her a shot collar, and I bought her a straight jacket. So y'all pray for me. I don't know how I'm going to raise four girls. Come on. Help me. Help me help you. All right. Yes, we're going to laugh a little bit. It's okay. Everybody relax. Take a deep breath. It's good. We're family. As some of you know, um, uh, I named my daughter Arrow, okay? Contrary to popular opinion, I know my last name is Smith, okay? So contrary to popular opinion, I did not name my daughter Aerosmith from the 80s rock band. Okay? I know you would like to think that. I had one of my friends from high school, dude, you like Aerosmith? I'm like, no, I hate them. I did not name my child Aerosmith from Steven Tyler. I'm, help me. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit. Some of you that, that watch Facebook or stalk Facebook or whatever you do, um, you heard the story. I'm going to share you because it, it leads into the message today. Um, Arrow, where, where, where is this? You know what's going on here? So I'm preaching at this, um, I'm preaching at this conference in Wanchis. All right, and as I'm preaching, uh, the message that God gave me was arrows in God's hand, and so 
I'm preaching, and before I was able to sit down, the Lord said, this is the name of your baby girl. And I'm like, really? And, then, and so I, I have another funny story, but I don't have time. But I sent Kimber. I finally got a text through to Kimber. And she texted me back, and she said, interesting. Um, but what the Lord spoke to me was that she was to be an arrow in his hands. And that her life was full of destiny and purpose. That he created her to hit the mark. And that she was going to release the kingdom of God wherever she went. And I said, that's enough for me. <laughs> Woo! That's enough for me. Um, so, uh, so that's the name Arrow, okay? Not Aerosmith. Well, it is Aerosmith. Um, but hopefully by the time she's in high school, it won't, it won't be a thing. So in that, the Lord was speaking to me about this message in Ephesians saying, Jamie, this is a word I want my body to hear. This is not just for your daughter. This is a word I want all of my kids in, at Liberty to hear, that you are all God's chosen arrows. Are you all with me in that? That the Lord has a desire for each of you to come and hear this word, that you were created with purpose and destiny, and you were created uniquely fashioned and designed by the Lord to hit his mark. And so I want everybody, before they leave, to know that that is God's desire for you, to make you into a polished arrow. So let's turn to Isaiah 49 and look at it scripturally. If you guys won't mind turning your Bibles there, for those of you that still bring Bibles to church. It's okay, you don't have to hide. Isaiah 49. All right, I'm going to read it nice and loud to you. Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 2. Um... So, I, I will have you know that this is not just a crazy idea born in my mind. The Bible is full of the idea of archery, arrows, um, targets. There's 60 references in the Word of God to uh, arrows and bows and uh, archery, okay? And one of my favorite verses of this is in Isaiah 40, 49, where the prophet Isaiah, he's actually contextually for the, all the scholars out there that need this. Don't we have some Liberty Boys in the house today? Can you guys give them a hand? Hey, Matt. Love you, bro. Um, so for all the scholars out there, I, I, I do understand uh, the, the context here. He is speaking of the Messiah, okay, um, in this scripture that Jesus was to come and be a chosen arrow in the hands of the Lord to bring the gospel. But now that we are in Christ, guess what the mission is? It belongs to us now. And so we can't just say, okay, Jesus, we are now his hands and feet. And so we become the chosen arrows that the Lord sends. Y'all with me? All right, all right. So let's read this. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born... The Lord called me, and from my birth he has made mention of my name. He has made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He has made me into a polished arrow. Everybody say polished arrow. He has made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. Powerful word from the prophet that he has made me into a polished arrow. The apostle Paul talks about this. He alludes to this in Romans 6 where he says, we are God's instruments of righteousness. Uh, Second Timothy, you see him saying this. I absolutely love this. If a man is willing to be cleansed, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared for any good work. This is a biblical idea that God has a desire to use your life as an instrument to hit his mark. A weapon, if you will. The psalmist says he's preparing our hands for war. So, I'm going to talk to you this, about this. Uh, how many of you guys absolutely love the display? Pretty cool? Okay, can you give a hand to Kevin Herbin? Because he hand did this. For our church. It's beautiful. 
I want this in my living room when people walk in. Um, this, ladies and gentlemen, is a polished arrow. Okay? Um, now, Kevin made the stands, but our very own Bobby Duvall made the arrow. <laughs> the mayor of Collington himself. Bobby made this arrow. Now, I don't, I don't know if you can really see it well, but if you were to hold it, it is exquisite. Um, this is not something that you can go out to Kmart today and buy, okay? This is something that takes a long time. This is something that involves an incredible amount of preparation, and this is an incredible process in making this beautiful arrow. And if I had a bow, I did this in youth group, but I figured if I brought the bow up here, y'all call security. I know I would. Um, if I had a bow, this thing would fly through the air with precision. That it's been straightened, feathered, this beautiful tip on, on here, this thing is made to launch. And, and, and look, Bobby took a long time in this. And what I need you to understand today is the scripture says that he has made me into a polished arrow. This is not something that you wake up and you are born a polished arrow. Y'all hear me? You aren't just born looking like this. This is something that God does as a process. So my whole sermon today is about the process. And we're going to talk and walk through together what it looks like to move from this really nasty piece of wood into this beautiful instrument that can fly through the air and hit the mark. So that's what we're going to do today. Y'all excited? All right, I'm going to put this back up here. Help me. Okay. Um, so we're going we're gonna to walk through that together. Because um, as you know, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a significant amount of preparation. Second Timothy says, an instrument of noble purposes prepared for any good work. But, you know, can, we can all be honest, right? All of us want to fly, don't we? All of us, everybody here wants to do amazing things for God. Every single person wants to be launched by the Lord and just hit the mark. But the thing about it is, is not all of us are willing to submit to the process of what it takes to be launched. You hear me? That all of us want to go out and, and change the world for God, but not everyone wants to submit to the process. Um, I'm embarrassingly going to tell you this story. Um, I was thinking about this, uh, that, you know, as people, we want the benefits, we don't want the cost. Um, so I had this bright idea a couple years ago that I was going to run a half marathon. I want you to know that I don't run, okay? But I had the idea I was going to run a half marathon. I mean, how hard can it be? I mean, Miss Catherine, oh, no, no disrespect, no disrespect. Michelle, uh-oh, she's giving me the look. <laughs> um, how hard can it be? A half marathon. I mean, I ran 20 years ago before I had kids. I mean, this was going to be so easy. I was going to show up and blow up. I mean, for real. That was in my mind. I didn't need any preparation. Come on. And then I ran into Noah Snyder. Is Noah in the house today? All right, Noah. Good, good. We get to embarrass each other together. Um, and Noah was like, you know, Smith, you've got to come to boot camp. Probably he said that to you too. Um, you got to come to boot camp, man. You, you know, you, you really need to like prepare yourself for this, man. You need, you know, you got to stretch. I'm like, hey, dude, I don't do yoga with guys, all right? I'm like, and he was like, man, you got to stretch. You got to drink water. Like come, come to boot camp. Actually had a free couple days. Come and prepare yourself. And I'm like, all right, boot camp. What's boot camp? I show up with a large Starbucks coffee. He's like, dude, you need to drink, Jamie. I'm like, I got my Starbucks. I show up, you know, I'm like, this is going to be easy. I got this. Get there. Uh, you know where this is going. Get there. You know where this is going. Get there. And he has us doing the, not sprints, but, and he keeps saying, you know, Smith, don't overdo it. 
like, that you haven't run in a long time. I'm like, don't overdo it. You need to relax. Just, you, you know, you, you, got, you got to slow down. I'm like, no, stop, man. I'm like Forrest Gump. I ran in high school. And so we start this, like, sprint. Uh, but it, and so I'm like, you know what? Everyone else is jogging, but I'm like, I'm going to show you these people. And I start, I'm, I'm running so fast. In fact, I'm lapping people, you know. I'm feeling so good about myself. And all of a sudden, in the middle, this is like after a minute and a half, it's like someone punched me in the leg. And my leg stopped working. And I am, I am trying to run, and my leg's not working. I'm like, what has happened? And it, it's a cramp, and I hadn't had a cramp like this in so long. And Noah's like, how you doing, man? I'm like, I'm great, Noah. And, and, and at that time when we finished the first exercise, I can feel my Starbucks coffee. It's coming up my throat. You think I'm kidding. I'm dragging my leg, and I have coffee coming out of my nose. And the women are making fun of me. But I won't say anything. I'm trying to pull it off. I'm trying to act like it's all good. And then, and then we move into this God-forsaken thing called a burpee. You all know what a burpee is? Uh, show us. <laughs> you all want me to show you? I'm not showing you. Hey, look, I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> all right? I can't squat anymore because I'm getting too old. So he does this burpee where you lay down. I, you know, I thought it was a boot camp. This is a concentration camp. No, momentum concentration camp. And so, so I, my, I can't move my leg. I'm jumping up, slapping my hands, and when I slap my hands, I get a neck crank. I pinched a nerve in my neck. So I'm walking like this. My leg doesn't work. There's coffee coming out of my nose. And Noah's like, you good, Smith? I'm like, I'm good, man. This is the best day of my life, Noah. And I was 10 minutes into the workout 20 minutes 20 minutes and I learned a lot that day I made it to the end of the workout and you know I was like you coming back I'm like I'll be back bro and I've never come back and I never will come back I'm content with my dad bod I had a neck crank for two weeks momentum so, I love you, Noah. Yeah, everyone should go. They really should. It wasn't for me, but y'all should go. And so, I never really told you the whole story, Noah. But anyway, all that to say, you'd be proud of your youth pastor. I went to the marathon, and guess what? I didn't run. I handed out waters. <laughs> but I learned a lot that day. You know what I learned? One, I'm 40 years old. <laughs> and, and two, I wanted the benefits. I was thinking like, uh, what is that, cheaper by the dozen, when they were holding up the signs with their dad. Like, you can do it, dad. I, was, I had that vision in my mind of them at, at the finish line. I wanted to cross the finish line. But you know what? I didn't want to submit to the process. I wanted all the benefits of finishing the marathon, but I didn't want any of the cost. Am I preaching to anyone? How true is that in our walk with Christ? Everybody wants to fly. Everybody wants to run. Everybody wants to cross the finish line. But who's willing to submit to the process? Everyone and everything that God has ever used, he first prepares. Everyone and everything God has, has ever used, he first prepares. So we're going to talk um, together in the next 20 minutes about this process, okay? And it's a pretty fascinating process of tr being transformed from uh, a gnarly block of wood into a polished arrow. But, but I, do, I do want to mention to you, um, this preparation thing is real, and it's, and it's biblical, you know, everyone loves to talk about David, right? We love David. We sing songs, and David's a great man of faith. But, but like, if you read his story, like, so he was prophesied to be the king of Israel, and then he endured 15 years of preparation, where he was running for his life, hiding in caves. He was discouraged, downcast, 
He went through all these different years. And you know what the Lord was doing? He was preparing him, as the Bible says, to shepherd Israel with integrity of heart. It is not an overnight process, this thing called spiritual maturity, as Pastor John preached. This is not something where you snap your fingers or even come up to the altar and get zapped by the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden you're a polished arrow. Y'all still with me? This is something that takes time. This is something that you have to submit to. Joseph, 17 years old, has this amazing vision of what his life is going to be. And you're like, oh, oh, great. And then all of a sudden you read the story of Joseph and it's one thing after another in the woodshed. Falsely accused, thrown in prison. What else happened to him? Okay, thrown in the pit, whatever he said. And, and you see 12 years, 12 years, setback after setback. Just, you know, it, it appears that there's, that there's this refinement going on in his life. And the Bible says... You know, after 12 years of refinement, Joseph is second in command in all of Egypt. And he saves the entire nation from starvation. And I know if Joseph was here today, he would sit up here and tell you, that process was not easy. That process was painful. It was difficult. I wanted to quit. But the Lord was in every bit of the process. And that's my word today. So if you get that, we can pray and go. You want to go? Really? <laughs> kind of hurts my feelings. Um, all right. So the first thing uh, I want to talk about is, uh, I'm sorry, I've got a cold, so I've got to keep drinking. Um, the first thing that I want to um, talk about is, is this, uh, the first thing the craftsman has to do is examine the piece of wood, and the craftsman really had to have an eye for the wood. Now, you look at this right here. I mean, it is kind of pretty because it's driftwood. This is very popular right now. But this is a gnarly piece of wood, okay? You look at this piece of wood right now, and you're like, there is no way we're going from that to this. You hear me? And I'm thankful for Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus can look at something like this, and you know what he sees? He sees that. And you know what? Some of y'all are stuck from flying. You know what? Before I even get into the process, some of y'all are stuck because when you look at yourself in the mirror, when you think about yourself, this is what you're looking at. This is what you see. God says, I want you to know something. First and foremost, before you were born, the prophet said, I saw that. Before you were born, I am able to look through your imperfections. I am able to look through your weaknesses. I am able to look through those things and find an arrow in there. And that is the most beautiful thing about Jesus. He is able to look through those things and find the arrow. Do you remember the scripture with a guy named Simon in the Bible? He's a fisherman, hot-headed, reckless, impatient. Sounds like Jamie to me. My wife said amen in the back. You know what he did? Hot-headed, reckless, impatient. He goes up to Simon. He says, Simon, Simon, I know what your name means. Your name actually means shifting sand. That's what Simon's name meant. He says, I don't see Simon. You know who I see? I see Peter. And Peter, that name meant you're going to be a rock. I see a rock in you. When there was no Peter, Jesus saw Peter. Isn't Jesus wonderful, crowd? Aren't you thankful for that? That in our condition, he can say, you know what? I, I, I know you're struggling right now. I see these imperfections. But the truth is, I'm committed to that arrow that I put in there. That's the first step, okay? So the next thing that we do, uh, as Miss Catherine always says, he is able to see the treasure hidden in the jars of clay. Okay, second process is what, uh, what I like to call um, where a craftsman finds the arrow, and one thing that he has to do is he has to be willing to sever the wood from the place where it once was. How many of y'all know, church, there is a time that we have to be separated from the ways of this world. 
This is the process that I refer to as the pruning process. Okay? Jesus said it like this. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. Everybody say prunes. So that it will be even more fruitful. There is a time, church, where you have to come away from the things of this world. That you have to leave environments that you have grown accustomed to. Places that you have been comfortable your whole life. And the craftsman said, you can't stay there any longer, Mr. James. I have got to cut you out of that. And as everyone in this church knows, that's a painful, it can be a difficult process. The pruning process. I was praying through this and I was thinking about this and I was thinking of this, this one story about my, my, uh, my girls actually. Um, it does choke me up to tell it and, and some of you have heard it before. But the Lord was dealing with me about my music and he was asking me, just let me take it. Let me take it. And this was at a point where I really did not like Christian music. I just thought it was so cheesy. Y'all, y'all pray for me, I know. Um, because I know y'all, some of y'all are with me. But um, th- it was just so cheesy, and I was, I was so over it, and I, I didn't like it. And Hillsong, all these things annoyed me. And the Lord's like, if you would give me the music, if you would let me prune that. That was a bad one. <laughs> I got it. If you would let me prune that from your life, if you would give it to me, I'm going to bless you. But I resisted him. And I didn't want to let go, and I wanted to hold it tight because I felt like it was mine. And he took it. And I remember seven months, I'd say a year later, we're in the green minivan, the green pickle, okay? I've got my hundred kids in the back, and I'm, I'm riding down the road, and I'm actually starting to enjoy K-Love. At that point, I didn't want anybody to know, okay? And I'm listening to K-Love, and there's a worship song on. And I, I was singing it with all my heart, and, and all of a sudden, I looked in the rearview mirror, and you know what I saw? I saw two of my girls, and they were singing every single word of the song. And the Lord said, do you understand now? I get it, Lord. I get it. This is not just about me. This is about a generation of people that my obedience, being able to let go of that, opened up a door where they get to say, look, my daddy loved worship music. And I watched him worship. What is the Lord trying to sever from your life? I can't, I I don't know what it is. I know what it's been for me. I know that there's been things and it's been really difficult. And look, we are good at justifying the things that we want to hold on to, aren't we? You got to let it go. There might be some habits or addictions in your life that you have been holding on to. And let me just tell you, you're hitting a ceiling, and until you allow the Lord to take it from you, you're never going to get through that and fly. Don't say that you can't do it. He will cut off every branch in you that does not bear fruit. Maybe it's a relationship. There's a time where I had to look at some of my, some of my boys from high school, some of the things that we used to do, you know, steal and getting caught. There's a time where I said, look, I love you guys, but I can't run with you anymore because the Lord's calling me out. So what is it in your life? What attitude, what lifestyle? I mean, look, Miss Catherine got up here a couple weeks ago, man, and she brought it. And what she said was a word to our body. One of those things that holds us back is unforgiveness. You sit out here today and you got bitterness and you got grudges and you got unforgiveness in your heart. Do you expect to fly? You ain't never going to hit the mark. You are never going to be able to fulfill your destiny if you let the branches remain. So I don't know what it is for you. I know what it is for me. But I'm asking you, pleading with you as one of your pastors, let it go. My girls would get up here and sing for you, let it go. And that would be weird. But they would do it, and it would be a great illustration. Next week. What is he severing from you? Because look, church, we're not called to blend in. The Bible says we're holy. 
And that means separated. That means we're in to bring the light. So when they look at us, I'm going to R-rated movies, and I'm seeing a bunch of high school kids there, and they're looking at me like, wait a minute. There's a time where I say, you know what? That's the last movie I'm going to see like that. Not because I'm legalistic, not because I'm trying to be a better Christian than you, but because I'm not called to that lifestyle. So what is it in your life? Let it go. Let it go. Let him, let him prune it. It hasn't helped you. It's been holding you back. It's been dragging you. You are not able to launch like you could launch if you could only see the targets he has for you if you would let him just prune it. Okay. Lastly, this gets more fun. Straight. Everybody say straightening. The straightening. And this is even more painful. Okay, so this is by far the most time-consuming process. It involves an incredible amount of pressing and stretching. Because the most important part of an arrow to make it fly straight is to get the shaft straight. Okay, because if the shaft is not straight, there is no way that the arrow is going to be able to fly through through the air and hit the mark. So this is one of the most time-consuming processes where the craftsman has to get the knots and the bends out of the wood. It's a very time-consuming process, and it involves a lot of pressure. You all ever feel like that before? You, you, You ever feel like that sometimes? That the Lord's trying to get something out of your life and there's pressure almost to the point where you're like, I I can't take it anymore. What are you doing, Lord? Let me just tell you, this is all part of the process. The Bible says in Isaiah, a bruised reed I will not break. That you feel like you're going to break. And you feel like it's painful and you don't understand what the Lord is doing. But let me just tell you, he knows exactly what he's doing. He is crap. He is at work in you, doing something so amazing, and you have to submit to this process. And if you're not willing to submit to sometimes the pressure in your life, you're not going to get there. It's a hard process. You know, I was thinking about this. Um, we live in a culture today, not just millennials, but maybe you guys can, uh, can agree with me here. There's a culture that keeps reinforcing this mentality that if it's hard, it's bad. You hear me? That's the culture today. If it's hard, it's got to be bad. And, and so we're creating this idea, and it's crept in the church, and it's an unbiblical concept. Do you hear me? So we think every time things are difficult, if things are painful, if I don't get along with someone in church, I'm just leaving. I'm just gone. Instead of working it out with that person, I'm just going to, oh, help me, help me, Jesus. I'm just out of here. Every time it gets hard, it must be bad, so I'm done. That's an unbiblical concept. It's an unbiblical concept. When you get to this place, if you bail on everything, oh, my work's hard, my employer's hard, oh, there's people in my life that are difficult, you are never going to become the polished arrow God wants you to be. We're growing a culture of quitters. We don't want to persevere. When it gets hard, we think, oh, this must not be the Lord. And that's actually the furthest thing from the truth. Now, everything that's hard is not all from the Lord. But if he's in control, then everything that happens to you, he's going to work it for good. Am I preaching? Don't bail. Don't bail. There's people that are going from church to church to church to church to church. There's 15 churches in one year because they're, they come up to something hard. And you know what? And they're getting stretched. And like, I'm out of here. Where do you get that from? I mean, it's funny. I do marriages all the time. I do weddings all, all the time. And uh, I'm, I'm, I've been doing more and more. In fact, Lee and Josh are here, and they just got married. And I, and I was thinking about this, and I have so many couples, and they come into my office uh, after they get married, okay? And I get married, and they're like, this is going to be so easy. And they call my office, and they're like, Pastor Jamie, and it's been like three weeks. They're like, I think we made the wrong mistake. Uh, It's so hard. We've been fighting. I don't think it's right. And I'm like, welcome to marriage. 
you know that the Greek word for marriage is tribulation, right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but it's true. Oh, Pastor Jamie, we've been fighting. Yeah. Hello, it's called marriage. It's not supposed to be easy. And anyone telling you that is not married. You, are, are you with me in this? Listen, it's good. Just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not good. Marriage is hard. Kimber stayed married to me for 15 years. Do you know how many times that she has probably wanted to bail? Do you know, you know how many times... I've never wanted to bail, just so you know, Kimber. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to eat good tonight. Um, listen, listen. People are getting divorced. 50%, Kevin told me before the service. 50%, you know what they're doing? They're buying into this mentality. They're buying into the mentality that this marriage is about meeting my needs and about making me happy. God's like, where did you get that idea from? Marriage is about commitment. Marriage is about perseverance. Marriage is about, I accept the things in you, and we're going to grow together. And I'm not going to quit on you, because I made a vow to you. Whew. Hard is not bad. <laughs> That's a wife back there. <laughs> that is a wife back She's like, preach on, my man. <laughs> preach on. <laughs> if I hit one thing right, it was that. All right. Let me show you scripture. Like, yeah, I don't know if I'm buying this, Pastor Jamie. I, I don't, I'm not sure I'm buying this. Let me give it to you scripturally just in case you want to fact check me. Uh, the word of God says it like this. Consider it pure joy, James says. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many levels, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. Do you hear that? So he says, look, Paul says it like this. I mean, James, I'm sorry. James says it like this. He says, look, 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 heart is not always bad. Consider it joy, church. When you go through trials, you know why? Because God is up to something. God is preparing you even if you don't understand or you can't see. If you will trust the craftsman in the pressing process, if you will trust him, he is maturing you. Don't give up. Persevere with people. Let go of the grudges. Don't let bitterness ruin your life. Get involved. I promise you, it's worth it. Consider it pure joy. When those trials come, you just say, hey, look, I'm going to count this joy. You know why? Because he's refining me, and he's going to make me fly even further. He's going to make me hit marks I never would have, would have, and I can look at my life and the most painful things in my life, the most painful things in my life, mm, they only allow me to fly farther. So, how am I doing? So, Job, remember Job? You guys know the story of Job? See, oh, I, I start following Jesus, everything good, gonna, it's all, all going to be good, it's going to be easy. Well, read the book of Job first, okay? As you read the book of Job, you realize he was a righteous man at the start, okay? He had faith in God. This wasn't because of his lack of faith. Job went through some incredibly horrendous things, incredible amount of testing. And at the end of the life, you know what Job said? After everything that he'd been to, everything that Job has persevered, all the tooling, all the time in the woodshed, you know what Job said? He said, listen, I had known about you but you know what he said? He said, but now, I had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Do you know, because in this process right here, in this process of stretching right here, when it gets so bad, do you know what happens? We get more intimate with Jesus. The more broken I am, the more I get to, the, I have had a nasty cold this week. It was one of the worst colds I've had in so many years. But you know what it's done to me? It has drove me into Jesus. And I know him better. So don't, don't jump out of those places. Don't be quick to jump out of some of those process. He is humbling you. He is refining you. He's crafting you into something magnificent. I'm going to close, uh, uh, Big Matt and you guys, if you guys want to come. Um, 
There's a couple things I want to declare over you. One, the first thing I want to declare is that as God's chosen instruments, we are people of purpose and destiny. Every single person, I want you to hear this from me, and I really believe from Jesus to you. You are a person of purpose and destiny. You are a purpose, you are a person of purpose and destiny. That there are marks that only you can hit. Do you hear me? In the body of Christ, we think every one of us, we're all assigned to the same thing. But you know what the cool thing about God is? Is each and every one of you has a different mark with your name on it. Uh, as I was studying the Greek word, the, and this blew, this blew me up. Uh, um, as I was studying the Greek word for sin, I ha- have come to find out, and I, I knew this, but it was just, it was, it was so, so much revelation in me. The, you know what the Greek word, one of the Greek New Testament words for sin is? It's actually an archery term. That the word sin is actually an archery term that means to miss the mark. Pretty powerful, isn't it? So I was thinking about that, and I want to close with this. We get so caught up in sin. We blow it. God's mad at us. And I think we've lost the real tragedy of what happens with sin. Because I want to submit to you today that the greatest tragedy is not the sins that you commit. It's the life that you fail to live. Y'all hear me? The tragedy is not, oh, I'm a sinner and I've done all these sins. No, the tragedy is, is you're not living out the thing that God's created you to do. That you're missing out on this life of joy and this life of peace where, where he is launching you through the air and you are fulfilling what God designed you and created you to be. That's the tragedy of sin. It's a weight on you that doesn't need to be there. So you have a decision today. We, I have a decision. We all have a decision. This is God's decision for your life. And I'm going to ask you guys, our prayer team's going to come, and we want to have a time of prayer, but I want you to, as you leave today, I want you to know that you are God's chosen instrument. And that he is preparing to launch you. That he, in his heart, he created you and he's preparing to send you. And the things that you're going to do with your life, if you'll submit to the process, are greater than you could ever ask and imagine. Amen? Greater than you could ever ask or imagine. I find myself at youth group sometimes and I'll be preaching and my team's beside me. And I'll see and kids get saved. And I know the Lord's in heaven going, yeah, buddy, this is what you were created to do. This is what I made you to do. Go and do it. And when I'm doing it, church, you know how happy I am? Do you know how much joy I have when I'm seeing these kids come to know Jesus? There's nothing I would rather do with my life than to be in his will. Today's the day. Today's the day. Let it go. He wants to launch you. And it's going to be amazing. Can we pray? Lord God, I just want to thank you for this amazing day. And I am so grateful for my church family. Lord God, I stand up here and I just feel so loved by you. And and I'm so thankful that there's a family that can love me and that I can love. But Lord Jesus, I ask you, Lord, that no one would leave today without allowing you cut off some dead weight. That today would be the day that you stop running and you would submit to the process. I thank you for the chosen arrows I'm looking at right now. That Father God, there are so many beautiful instruments in this room that if we would let the Lord use our lives, that the outer banks would be forever changed. That there would be the greatest revival that we've ever seen if we would just let go and let the Lord launch us. So bless them, Lord. Encourage them today. Thank you for your prophetic declaration that they are your chosen instruments. 
And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Look, I love you guys, and we're going to sing one. You're welcome to leave, but I'll be here at the altar, and I would love to hug and pray for you. Have a great day.